For 15 years, I've been working in prisons, psychiatric hospitals, and drug rehab centers, uh, really working with patients and inmates and using plants and using horticulture to explore the possibilities of how to heal lives that have been broken, misdirected, and many in some ways beyond repair. I'd like to start with Carol. Carol was a student of mine on Rikers Island, and for, for, for those of you who don't know what Rikers Island is, it's the largest penal colony in the world. It's the New York City jail system. Currently, on any given day, there are 15,000 inmates residing there. Carol is emblematic of how I see the prison population in the United States. Currently, we have 2.3 million individuals incarcerated in our country, and this is actually 25% of the entire world's population of prisoners. And to give you some indication of the, the increase, this dramatic increase over the last 30 years, back in 1975, we had about 200,000 inmates nationwide. There's been a huge increase, and even here in the state of Florida, in 1980, we had about 20,000 inmates, and today we have 100,000. Now, you're probably sitting there wondering, why should you care about prisoners? And the reality is, most of the people that we have currently serving time, they're in for nonviolent crimes. And the other problem is, it's really expensive to keep them there. And the third problem is, most of them are going to be released and coming home to communities like ours here in Miami. And how do we want them coming out of prison? For Carol, for example, she spent 25 years rotating in and out of different prisons. She was a crack addict. And like most of our inmates in the country today, it's a drug-related illness. And to raise money for her crack habit, she was a con artist. So she kept revolving in and out of prison, and that's also a great problem in our country because out of all those millions of people behind bars, most of them are going back. We have a 67% recidivism rate in our country. So out of three people being released, two are going back. And the costs keep rising. So for example, in the state of Florida or the state of California, we spend more money warehousing inmates than we do on college education. In California, in 1980, since 1980, they've built one college campus, but they've built 21 maximum and medium security prisons. And even more telling is that it cost $8,000 a year to provide state college education to an individual, while it cost in California $45,000 a year to keep them in prison. So the cost keeps rising, and it's not just an economic cost, it's also a social cost. For every parent in prison, there's a 65% chance that the child and the children of those individuals will also go to prison. And we call this the cradle to prison pipeline. And we also have to understand that as these costs go higher and higher, there is no money left for important things like programming or education. In fact, there's one thing that worked in keeping people from returning to prison, one thing, and that was if you gave them a college education while they were incarcerated, they were less likely to return. So what did we do? We eliminated the Pell Grant in 1993 which eliminated the opportunity for people to go to college while they're incarcerated. We took the one thing that we knew that worked, and we got rid of it. So here we have a system that's returning people back to communities with no programming. Maybe they get a little AA, maybe a little NA, maybe they get some anger management. But generally, they return back to a community where they don't have the skills they need to compete. They have the stigma of prison that prevents them from getting employment. They're not even allowed to vote. They are marginalized in our society. We call prison a graveyard of lost opportunity. 
but I choose not to see it that way. I see it as a nursery of opportunity, using the transformative powers of nature to change lives. That's my square one. This is my idea I'd like to share. It begins with land, neglected land. So this was given to me by the Department of Corrections in New York City on Rikers Island, two acres of land. There was nothing there, it was barren. I had a greenhouse that was also abandoned. And we began to take this land and transform it. And over time, I saw in the transformation of landscape, I saw the transformation of individual lives to where three years later, we can actually create a native forest out of dirt. I also found that as people came out to the garden, and as we developed our gardens on Rikers, I saw a complete change in their physical being. I saw people come out of the prison and they were extremely uh, debilitated and they were hunched over and their eyes were glazed and they were sometimes extremely angry about something that happened inside the jail. And, um, and after about four hours, I noticed a complete change as they went back. They, they were upright and they were singing or they were laughing. And I began to put two and two together and I saw that this was really a great possibility to heal all of these damaged lives. And how do we actually do this? Well, I knew that education was important, so the garden gave these individuals education. And I knew that vocational skills were important because most of the people I worked with were underemployed. Many of them never worked before. Many of them had a junior high school education. So the garden gave them vocational skills. And I knew they needed a therapy, especially with the women who had gone through an entire lifetime of sexual abuse and drug abuse, and many of them were living out on the streets, and they would come into prison, and this is where they would actually get a moment of respite from the hardships of the life they in, that was imposed on them, and, and I knew that they needed therapy, and we needed a therapeutic and healing area, and that's what this garden did. It also gave them a place to mend, and we would work with them in addressing these social issues that kept leading them back to prison over and over again, and the garden did that. And in this garden, we also saw this capacity of design, because in design, I saw creation. So in one case, an inmate decided he wanted to build a gazebo, and I said, sure, and then from that gazebo came water. And from water, we created a waterfall, and from there we went to a pond, and then before we knew it, we had put down Tibetan prayer flags, and the Tibetan prayer flags had this purpose, which was to keep the geese from flying into the pond and defecating, which is what geese like to do. And we also knew that in this design, every element had at least two purposes, so while the prayers were being flapped to heaven, the geese were prevented from crapping. <laughs> but connection was very important. And people used to ask me, and, I, and, and it's a very interesting situation, like, well, how do you get people to connect to nature? How does this connection begin? You know, I would walk into the prison and I'd think, okay, I'm gonna recruit people for my program and hopefully they'll be with me for up to a year. And I get into the classroom and I look out and I see all these individuals sitting there, and it could be men or it could be women, they were never together at the same time um, in prison. Uh, but I would look out over the crowd and I'd think, what is it that I have to offer them? They've been underemployed, social services have taken away their children, half the women in prison have, are HIV positive. What am I gonna do to create any kind of change? Why are they even gonna listen to me? And I'd look out and I'd see these guys and they would look kind of annoyed and they would look almost like aggressively bored and they would wonder, what is this guy, the flower guy they used to call me, what the hell is he gonna talk about? And I'd look at them and there'd be like this little moment of silence and a little bit of tension. And I'd look at them and I'd say, in 45 minutes, and if you choose to stay with me for up to a year, in that time, you're gonna learn how to grow really good pot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there was the connection. <laughs> 
Why? Because they're all in for drugs, and everyone should know at least where drugs come from, and they're coming from plants. And they'd be raising their hand and waving, <laughs> taking notes, telling the guy next to them to shut the hell up. <laughs> you know? But I saw this wonderful connection because I also believe that we have this 50,000-year relationship with plants, which is uh, longer than some marriages. But um, in this relationship, it's encoded in our DNA because through our lives, through these 50,000 years, we developed all of our skills, all of our civilization based on this relationship whether we cultivated food, whether we foraged, whether we picked up the berry that killed us or didn't kill us and gave us pleasure, which whether it was a drug or a, psych, you know, a uh, medicine, this was our legacy. This is how we survived. And so I looked at this connection and I had a great belief that the circuitry had been basically disrupted for two or three generations, especially in our urban areas where people had no connection to plants whatsoever, or didn't know they had the connection. And anyway, I, I, I turned around and, and I thought, okay, let's just plug them back in, you know? Let's plug them back to the circuitry and let it begin. And I also looked at the connection for people in, in, in prison to be a part of the community because Prison isolates and marginalizes and alienates people from the very community that they're going to be returning to. So in one instance, we built this rooftop garden in prison and we dissembled it and we brought it to a, we brought it to a rooftop site in Upper West Side of Manhattan for an organization that housed um, the mentally ill and formerly uh, homeless. So these folks would actually have a place to go. And so we built this whole garden in prison, and then we transformed the space into something where people wanted to go to. And then I began to see this transformative power of taking neglected space, space that people did not want, and space that was never used, and turn it into something that was extremely powerful and useful. So all of a sudden, the patients went up to the rooftop, and they would do yoga and smoke a lot of cigarettes, and in a very pleasing setting. <laughs> and I began to see that this was a way to start looking at space differently. And at one point I thought, well, there's also a way, instead of connecting to people, let's connect to the regional ecology. How can we take this one step further? And an inmate told me, well, you know, we have West Nile virus in New York City, and, and I began hearing that, and, and, and Mayor Giuliani would come on the, the television and radio, and he would tell everyone, don't go outside at 4 p.m. Now, this is New York City. <laughs> and then at 4 p.m., it's like, why doesn't he want to go outside? And at 4 p.m., this plane would fly overhead, and it would drop pesticides to kill all the mosquitoes that had somehow caused one or two deaths from West Nile virus. And I kept thinking, wow, how many people died from that? So... My guys had this idea, they said, well, why don't we build bat houses and then we could bring the bat houses out to city parks and that way the bats will take care of the mosquito population. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. So that's what we did and it allowed them to come up with solutions that actually had a positive impact on the community that they were excluded from. Because the planes certainly weren't flying over Rikers Island. And the bats always knew where to go for some reason. So then I moved to Miami, and in Miami, I saw the same problems, but I sat, found that there were greater opportunities because in Miami, as you, you all know, we have a 12-month growing season. You can grow food all year round. And we were in communities that are classified as urban food deserts. All of a sudden, you have all these people that live in these underserved communities, and they don't have access to fresh food. So we started this program at a drug rehab center um, up in Opalaka, which is an underserved neighborhood. And again, we looked at neglected space and we took this old palm plantation that they had been dumping a lot of herbicides and, on, and pesticides on and we kind of cleared out some of the palms and we took over a sandy area and we started to work with people who were remanded by the, the court system to be in a drug facility. And if they didn't complete their drug program, they too would go to prison and they would be that one more link in the cradle to prison pipeline that I've been trying to work against. So we took the same kinds of people, the same kinds of folks who needed help and we put them to work 
trying to change or transform this landscape that had been in, under a state of neglect. And in about a year, we had something like this, which is a food forest. And we could take that food and we could bring it back into the community. And in a, for the first year, I think we had about 200 papayas that went out, among other things. I, I always think of the papayas because they're easy to count. But the papayas went out into these low-income neighborhoods where there were farmers markets and they were subsidized to provide fresh produce for communities in desperate need of new, of, of, of food <laughs> that <laughs> combated the issues of, of um, dietary health problems. So what I learned also was that working with drug addicts isn't the easiest thing. And because there's always a very powerful impulse, there's a chemical dependency. It's almost a bit of a chemical thing and it's a mental illness kind of thing and that you're combating a lot of, a lot of trigger points and you're going to deal with as much failure as you will with success. And I recall working in New York City and I was working with this woman who was one of my students from Rikers and she was released and we had all these projects. We would go, <clears throat> go around all over New York City building gardens and we would be paid and then she would be paid. And uh, she was a, a brilliant gardener. She was a star and in fact her last name was Star. And one day I went to look for her and she didn't show up at the job site and I looked all around and I put out calls and eventually I found out she was rearrested for selling drugs in a school zone because she had connected with her ex-boyfriend who was a drug dealer. And she was sentenced to four years to a prison in upstate New York. And there I felt like a total failure and I thought, what was the point of all that? You know, like, like I'm busting my ass and no matter what I do, I'm looking at failure all around and I thought maybe I should, you know, should never have left my job on Wall Street as a commodities analyst doing this kind of thing. Um, but then I thought, you know, it was a shame because we had planted all these gardens and that was my aha moment. I thought, wow, I worked all over New York City planting gardens with this woman. We went into the, some of the most ugliest, neglected, abandoned, barren areas and put in something beautiful. I remember once we planted a garden in a library in uh, East New York, a library that no one went to, and we planted this garden there and after three months, people went there from the neighborhood to take their um, marriage pictures. And I thought of all the people in all these different neighborhoods and communities that benefited from her work, and even though she had failed, what she did was she left behind something that was vital and important for the rest of the people in her community. So then I started to switch my perspective on what failure and success was, and I thought, well, this is a beautiful thing. It's not like giving somebody a job you know, fixing computers. They're building gardens for the entire community. In the same way that these guys out here, they're building these model urban farms. They're demonstrating not just to themselves, which is very important, but they're demonstrating to anyone all over the city how you can grow a food forest garden in Miami for anyone. And that to me was a semblance of hope that despite their efforts of staying clean or not staying clean, we are doing something vital for society and we may not get it the first time. And in this process, there is always this process in building a garden or working with people who are struggling to make important changes in their lives. But in this process, we can create something absolutely amazing. And actually these guys end up, they work with us in different projects all over Miami, as well as their work building food forests at the rehab center. And then I began to see, in all these spaces all over Miami, areas of neglect. And then I began to think, you know what? There's great opportunity in neglect. That was another one of my TED moments. Opportunity in neglect. So we looked at this piece of land and we looked at trees that nobody wanted. These are invasive Australian pines. And so we got rid of them. And then we used the mulch that nobody wanted. And then, of course, we were working with guys who were marginalized by society that many people didn't want. 
And we took coconut husks that were thrown away, and obviously no one wanted those, and then we took some pineapple tops that people threw away because nobody really wants those, and we started putting them all together on land that nobody really wanted and nobody really used except for this billboard. And the billboard was probably selling things that nobody really wanted to buy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but on this land, we created a food forest that will one day provide food for people all over Opelaka or Miami Gardens um, who can't afford to go to, say, some of our more expensive, fresh, organic food uh, uh, venues such as Whole Foods or Fresh Market. And this is really a way of bringing it right into the community. And it's also a way of creating in younger people this concept of stewardship, how to become stewards of the land, how to see how you can extract food and make a real difference in your own environment and also to take skills that will lead you to survive for the rest of your life. Now, it's said that when there's no hope, that's when it's time to plant a garden. And I work with elderly lifers and long-term sentenced inmates in a um, facility in South Florida. These guys, if, they do, if they're not serving life, they're most likely serving enough time where they're going to die in prison. It's a question of, well, why would you want to work with them? But the reality is, is that there's something very powerful. There's almost something profound in giving hope to those who least deserve it. But I find that these guys have taught me so much in the human, in the resilience of both the human spirit and in nature. And because this is what they work with. What they're trying to do is they're trying to grow food for themselves and other inmates. And the other reality is that elderly inmates, elderly Elderly inmates cost the taxpayer about $55,000 a year for health-related issues. So what they're trying to do is, and which are diet-related, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to grow food for each other to improve their health and their diet. But this is what they use to dig in soil like this. <clears throat> so there's very little opportunity to grow a beautiful garden, but they somehow manage with a little bit of compost, a little bit of seeds, they're able to create over time in very impoverished conditions something like this. And then we take it one step further and I think, well, how do we take people who will never be part of society and make them part of society? So I have them growing small seedlings inside prison like these papayas and they bring them out to the community, through me, of course, <laughs> and they give them to my guys, and I give them to, to the guys I work with who also have one foot in the prison door, and they turn around and they plant in these low-income communities where we have our food forests, and that's their way. These elderly men in prison, this is their way of making a very profound connection to the community. And what we have is the new generation of, in, of stewards and environmentalists because we want to break this prison to pipeline, this cradle to prison pipeline. So if we can complete the circle, the pipeline can be broken. Imagine a society, a criminal justice system that for every negative response gives us a positive response. So for every negative action, instead of responding in a punitive way with another negative action, which gives you two negative actions, we get a positive response from a negative action. We take people in prison and we make them do something with a positive outcome. That to me is how a criminal justice system can have a positive impact on people's lives. And if those people, if those inmates are doing something that benefits our land, which is undergoing intense environmental destruction all the time, 
if we can't use those neglected spaces and turn it into something positive, and if we can't use people who are in very negative circumstances and turn it into positives, then we're losing this wonderful, amazing opportunity to help not only heal people, but heal the land. Dostoevsky wrote, society is judged by how it treats its prisoners. But I will add that society also is judged by how it treats its land. And the two go together hand in hand. And what happened to Carol? Well, Carol was released, and she now works as a landscape designer and a gardener in Virginia. And she's been clean 10 years. I want to thank you.